Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the seventh Mama Charitable Foundation Fisting Professor in Buddhist Studies Lecture Series. The theme of the series this time is Happiness, Worldly, Spiritual, and Transhuman. This year, we are very honored to have invited Professor Damon Cohn, an authority on Buddhist ethics and a prominent bioethicist, to be our Mama Charitable Foundation Fisting Professor. The first two lectures on worldly happiness and spiritual happiness were supposed to be held last Friday and Sunday, but unfortunately they have been cancelled at the end. Nevertheless, we are still able to enjoy the lecture tonight on the topic Transhuman Happiness. Before the lecture begins, I would like to invite Dr. Guang Xing, Director of the Center of Buddhist Studies of the University of Hong Kong, to give the welcome speech. Dr. Guang Xing, please. and uh, President Zhang Xiang, and also Mr. Liang, and uh, thank you all, and good evenings. Um, it's a great honor for me to introduce this, uh, you the Mama Charitable Foundation Visiting Professor in Buddhist Studies. And as you know, as uh, Carol said, we canceled the first two lectures, and we are thinking ways to make up. Therefore, we might think about videotape the other two lectures and upload, for example, like YouTube or the university website so that you can visit and watch the video anytime. And uh, this is the theory you can say focused on happiness. In fact, Buddhism is aiming for happiness. The foundation is morality. So we will listen to Professor Damien King's you know, presentations and his reasons why Buddhist idea of happiness based on, you know, morality. Professor Damien King is uh, my teacher and also my friend. And something like, I think, 20, 20 years ago when I was in SOAS, he was my internal examiner, and later on we worked on many things, and I invited him to come, I think, in 2008, 2010. He came already and gave five lectures. And he is a world leading scholar in Buddhist ethics. I think many of you sitting here read his books and also articles. Therefore, no need me, in fact, to, to say anything because most of you know his names, at least, even if you have never seen him face to face. But I just say a few things. Professor Damien can publish many books, including, for example, the, the Nature of Buddhist Ethics, Buddhist Buddhism and Bioethics, and some other books are very popular. And many of these books in universities for teaching and as a, you know, textbooks. In my lectures, at least, I use some of his books and also articles he introduced all of you. I think you have attended my lectures there. And Professor Damien King is also a founding member and founding fellow, actually, for the Journal of Buddhist Ethics. It's an international-based uh, journal, free for everyone. It published first in 1994. So now it's something more than 20, 25 years. Uh, still continue, but of course he retired. And he also founded a series called Rutledge Critical Studies in Buddhism Series. And he, with together, Charles Prebis founded this series. I'm lucky enough, my book being published there, so I have many connections with him, in fact. Yeah. And he, of course, later on also retired again to young people. It's a great honor for us to have Professor Damien King here with us and present and to give us a quite interesting uh, uh, lectures. And Professor Damien King, of course, uh, will give you all these uh, talks. And this uh, professor, visiting professorship lecture series won't be possible without the generous donation of Mama Charitable Foundation. And particularly, Mr. Leon, who is sitting here, and we are very grateful for his support. 
Something like eight years ago, he donated 10 million Hong Kong dollars to establish this uh, visiting professorship. That's why this is the seventh you know, visiting professor lecture series. And uh, we have this great honor, and he is a presenter here. So I'm very much thank you so much for supporting. And also, we thank the president is by coming here, president is a great support to us, and particularly in this time. And last but not least, I also welcome all of you, and you come here to listen to these lectures. So now I just hand over to uh, Professor Damian King. Thank you, Dr. Guangxing. As a token of gratitude to Professor Ko, we have prepared a souvenir for presentation. Now I would like to invite Professor Zhang Shang, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong, to present souvenir to Professor Ko. Please give a big hand to welcome them to the stage. Thank you very much to Professor Ko for flying all the way to Hong Kong this time to give this lecture series. Thank you very much. So with Professor Zhang and Professor Kong, please remain on stage for the group photo. Now I'd like to invite a few more guests to join the photo session. They are Mr. Casey Leung and Mr. Albert DeRosa, representatives of the Mount Ma Charitable Foundation, together with Dr. Guang Xing, our center director, and Venable Hin Hong, senior advisor of our center. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you very much. The lecture this time won't be possible without the support of the Mama Charitable Foundation. So thank you once again for the generosity of the foundation. Thank you very much. May I invite our guests to be seated now? Yeah, please be seated. And without further ado, let's give another big round of applause to welcome Professor Cohn to begin the lecture. The slides are done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just getting some technical coaching here, folks. <laughs> well, thank you um, so much for that kind introduction, uh, Professor Guan Ying. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back again at HKU. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Mama Charitable Foundation for sponsoring these lectures and making all of this possible. And it's a great honor to have been invited as the seventh Mama Charitable Foundation visiting professor. Somebody told me that seven is lucky number in China. Is that right? I think I've been a bit unlucky this time with having, having the lecture canceled, so maybe, maybe seven is not the best number for me, but anyway. Um, I'm conscious that there are travel problems affecting everybody this evening, so I have, have been told I have to be fairly quick and precise and finish at 7.15, so I, I better get started uh, without further uh, ado. So, there were three lectures in this series. You see them there on the screen. The first one was dedicated to worldly happiness. Basically, that means things that in Buddhist sources are described as being to the advantage, benefit, and happiness of oneself and society at large. The second lecture is on spiritual happiness, which essentially means those qualities which 
pertain to the awakened mind, the awakened consciousness. And essentially, these are virtues of wisdom, compassion, generosity, and so forth, which we're all familiar with from Buddhist sources. Then we come to tonight's topic, which is transhuman happiness, by which I understand basically the technological enhancement of the first two kinds of happiness. So in other words, worldly happiness and spiritual happiness can be enhanced so it's thought or hoped or believed through technological means. So transhuman happiness is really, as I say, as it says at the top there, the enhancement of worldly happiness primarily by focusing on health and extending lifespan. And spiritual happiness by enhancing our cognitive powers, powers of concentration, memory, intellect, general understanding, and so forth. Now, there's not really anything radically new about this concept of enhancement. It's something we've always been doing. We've always been uh, attempting to improve our health through various means, to look nicer, by makeup, fashion, and all the other things listed there, mentally to enhance ourselves through education. And we're in a university tonight. The purpose of a university is to enhance our knowledge. And also, we have religions and moral teachings which try to uh, make us more spiritually aware and better people. So this isn't really anything radical, the idea of enhancement. In fact, I can see in the audience many people look to me to have been enhanced already uh, because you're wearing these. Yeah, this is visual enhancement. We've probably got other things as well, uh, <laughs> which I won't go into, but which have been implanted in us by doctors for various purposes. So transhuman happiness is really just taking this a step further, taking it to a new level. Um, there is a question, how far can this go? And we may come to a point where we have a radical transformation such that human nature is no longer the way we understand it at the moment. And we have a kind of new species of person, which we could call a digital person who doesn't exist in a physical way that we do now. So that will require us to rethink the idea of happiness. So what sort of methods are there for enhancement? Now that's, can you see that slide? It seems to be a bit washed out there, but um, I've listed here a few ways in which um, we can be enhanced falling into two main categories, bodily and uh, mentally. So in terms of bodily enhancement, we have various technologies with, like cloning and uh, gene editing. And uh, what's the last one there? Can't quite see that one. Cryonics. So I'll say something about those in a moment. And also uh, ways of enhancing our ourselves mentally through pharmaceutical means neural implants, nanobots, which are like tiny robots, which can be injected into the body and through artificial intelligence. So let me start with one of these, cloning. The cloning of Dolly the sheep in 1997 caused a furore in the scientific world and also a lot of moral concern. Most of that has now died down, and the technique has not proved as revolutionary as most people imagined. Some people, however, still see cloning as offering a path to immortality. Cloning takes two forms, reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning. To achieve immortality on this basis through reproductive cloning would require a string of zombie clones into which our personalities could be downloaded one after another. Clearly, there are scientific and philosophical challenges to this proposal, and few transhumanists regard it as a serious option. Therapeutic cloning offers a more realistic route by repairing our existing body so that it lasts longer. However, cloning is unlikely to deliver the indefinite life extension 
that most transhumanists seek. It does, however, raise some interesting talking points for Buddhism, such as whether clones would have the same karma as their originator, and whether it would be possible to clone a Buddha, for example. You may have heard in the news last year about um, Barbara Streisand having her pets cloned. You can see in the, in the background to the picture there is a gravestone with a photo in the middle. That was a pet of hers that died called Samantha. And then she missed the, the pet so much that she had uh, two more clones to replace them. It cost her $50,000 each. If you're interested, it's possible. Okay, let's move on to gene editing. This offers a more, more potential as a therapeutic technique because it operates directly on our DNA. The aim of gene editing is to remedy genetic abnormalities and alleviate hereditary diseases. Treatments of this kind work by repairing genetically abnormal cells. In 2012, scientists developed a new tool to modify genes that has revolutionized the field of molecular biology. This goes by the acronym CRISPR and is often described as a pair of molecular scissors that allow scientists to cut and paste genes at will in animals, plants, and human beings. The technique is relatively simple and has many potential uses. There are hopes it can be used to delete genes that prevent the immune system from attacking cancer cells, for example, and correct defective genes responsible for diseases. The consequences of tinkering with genes in these ways are not yet fully understood, and possible side effects include off-target um, mutations leading to pathologies like cancer. Because of these risks, scientists agreed in 2015 that where CRISPR was used to modify embryo cells or sperm or egg cells, a technique known as germline editing, these cells should not be implanted to avoid the risk of a modified human genome being passed on to future generations and potentially altering the human gene pool with unforeseeable consequences. So as you can see in the slide there, there's two, two applications of CRISPR um, on the left to a single uh, individual and on the right with um, germline mutations which could result in that, those changes being handed down to children and further offspring. Although there was a moratorium on this um, <clears throat> technique, in November 2018, Chinese scientist He Jiangqiu broke the moratorium and announced the birth of the world's first genetically edited human beings, twin girls nicknamed Lulu and Nana. Dr. He altered the genes of the embryos in an attempt to make their cells resistant to the HIV virus. Scientists around the world criticized this work and a subsequent investigation by Chinese authorities revealed that Dr. He had evaded supervision protocols used unsafe methods and forged ethical review materials. Despite the widespread scientific condemnation of these experiments, Dr. He stated, we believe ethics are on our side of history. Supporters of such research point out that although the risks of germline therapy are great, so too are the potential benefits and believe the prospect of freeing future offspring from the misery of an inherited disease <clears throat> tips the balance in favor of experimentation. What can be said about the ethics of gene editing from a Buddhist perspective? There seems to be no great problem when the technique is used to cure a genetic abnormality in an individual patient. When used in germline therapy, However, I think Buddhists would have reservations similar to those noted above in connection with alterations to heritable DNA. Unequal access to the technology could also increase social inequality and result in humans becoming divided into subspecies. Scientist Stephen Hawking's last prediction was that the wealthiest in society would soon begin to edit the DNA of their offspring to produce a superhuman race 
thereby dividing humanity into genetic, into genetic haves and have-nots. An alternative path to an extended lifespan is cryonics. The Alcor Life Extension Foundation of Arizona defines cryonics as the science of using ultra-cold temperature to preserve human life with the intent of restoring good health when technology becomes available to do so. Cryopreservation is an experimental technique which aims at freezing and later resuscitating people who have died. Either the head or the whole body can be frozen. Today, embryos are routinely frozen and resuscitated, suggesting that life can be sustained in suspended animation for long periods of time although it has not so far proved possible to cryopreserve human organs for transplantation. In the case of the brain, some researchers believe that cryonics need not resuscitate the organ itself, but simply preserve the information it contains for later download. In terms of this approach, personality, memory and skills are encoded in the pattern or connection between neurons rather than physically embedded in the organ. In 2018, scientists working at cryo cryobiology company 21st Century Medicine successfully froze and rewarmed a complete pig's brain with its connectome, that's the wiring diagram of the brain, uh, still intact. This meant that the information stored in the brain's 150 trillion connections could, if the theory is sound, be recovered and uploaded into a new physical or virtual body. In another experiment in April this year, scientists in the USA partially revived a pig's brain after it had been decapitated for four hours. The researchers found that brain cell death takes much longer than previously thought, and that synapses, the communication between brain cells, could be restored. They detected no higher brain function or sign of consciousness, but results of this kind lend more credibility to the possibility of resuscitation. If a patient were to be cryonic, cryogenetically preserved before any serious deterioration in the brain had occurred, there would seem to be a better chance of resuscitation at a future date. Even assuming cryonics to be successful, however, it is not clear how someone would fare in the far distant future without friends or family. And the kind of welcome received may not be the cordial one expected. Nevertheless, there are people willing to take the risk. There are currently almost 300 cryonically frozen individuals in the USA, some 50 in Russia, and several thousand more signed up for the procedure. How does cryonics fit with the Buddhist teachings on rebirth? Buddhism teaches that rebirth occurs soon after death, either instantaneously or at the latest 40 days after death. And if a person's consciousness had already left the body, it would seem impossible for resuscitation to take place because the departed person would presumably have already been reborn elsewhere. Much, however, turns on what one understands by death. And perhaps someone declared dead on today's criteria might be easily resuscitated in the future. If a cryogenically frozen patient was successfully restored to life in the future, we might say that from a Buddhist perspective, the patient never really passed away. What happened was that he or she was placed on long-term life support. Effectively, they were in hibernation. And since no one died, no one was reborn. The patient who was later resuscitated then was the same as the one who died. Now we have somebody cryogenically suspended.
Now, it's clear that developments of the kind I'm talking about in science and technology are revolutionizing the way we think about ourselves. Leading futurologist Ray Kurzweil, who works at Google, mentions three overlapping revolutions in technology that he labels GNR, meaning genetics, neurotechnology, and robotics. He also speaks of a law of accelerating returns, or Moore's law, which holds that these advances will accelerate exponentially and be recursive. In other words, upgrades will become faster and more frequent. He predicts machines will pass the Turing test. You know what the Turing test is? That's how, how, whether you can tell if you're talking to a, a person or a machine by 2029. <clears throat> and that developments like quantum computing will take things rapidly to a higher level. Given the rate of advance in these technologies, transhumanists see human beings as poised on the cusp of an evolutionary quantum leap that will overcome many of their present limitations, including death. Bodies will be enhanced with bionic limbs and brains boosted by cybernetic implants and nanobots, tiny robots, that increase intelligence and cognitive skills. These graphs here show you Ray Kurzweil's projection of how things are likely to develop. So on the left, you see various forms of technology and a sort of curve going upwards as things progressed. And on the right, you see the exponential growth of computing power, which in the bottom left-hand corner was very low. And on the right, you see the kind of animal that this would have been um, equivalent to. So the earliest computers had the power of a kind of dragonfly's brain. And as time went by, they... Uh, gradually increased. So what will come up on the top right later on is presumably something even more evolved, <clears throat> this transhuman being which they speculate about. So Kurzweil envisages a merger between the fields of artificial intelligence, or AI, and robotics, culminating in something he calls the singularity or the point at which human and machine consciousness merge, bringing into being a new hybrid form of life known as a cyborg. So this graph shows you the green line is the sort of development in the human intellect over time, and then the purple one is the increase in machine intelligence. And where these two cross is the point labeled a singularity. So he predicts this will happen by <clears throat> 2045 and um, will mark the beginning of a new human-machine civilization and its super-intelligent and long-lived participants, it is believed, will enjoy happiness and fulfillment impossible for ordinary mortals. I've mentioned the term transhumanism several times, so perhaps it would help to have a definition of it. Transhumanism is essentially an intellectual movement that aims to change the way we think about ourselves and to bring about the evolution of, of intelligent life as envisaged in the post-singularity condition. A transhumanist manifesto called the Transhumanist Declaration, was drafted in 1998 by 23 transhumanist thinkers and serves as a platform for Humanity Plus, an organization that promotes transhumanist ideals. The Declaration speaks in Article 1 of, quote, the possibility of broadening human, in pot human potential by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering, and our confinement to planet Earth. Article 8 affirms, quote, we advocate the well-being of all sentience, including humans, non-human animals, and any future artificial intellects, modified life forms, or other intelligences 
to which technological and scientific advance may give rise. Oops. Phrases like the well-being of all sentience have a Buddhist ring to them. And as seen in the Declaration, the goal of transhumanism is a noble one of overcoming pain, suffering, sickness, and death. The very obstacles to happiness that are mentioned in the first noble truth of Buddhism. Ray Kurzweil says, I view disease and death at any age as a calamity, as problems to be overcome. Personally, he makes health a high priority. He mentions in his book that he takes 250 supplements a day and receives half a dozen intravenous therapies a week. That's probably a bit excessive, but here we are. So, given its aim of overcoming suffering, some see similarities between transhumanism and Buddhism. Buddhists today have been eager participants in scientific developments that seem to harmonize with transhumanist ideals. For example, Buddhists have worked with neuroscientists to understand the phenom phenomenon of neuroplasticity, the brain's capacity to change itself. The Dalai Lama proudly describes himself as half Buddhist monk, half scientist. With the assistance of advanced practitioners, scientists have made significant progress towards understanding how meditative techniques work. Based on these discoveries, some now suggest that traditional meditative practices can be integrated with emerging neurotechnologies in order to enhance self-control, compassion, insight, and altered states of consciousness. A number of apps and devices are being developed to help the practitioner hack the brain and experience the benefits of meditation without spending painful hours in the lotus posture. With further development, it may be possible to, to induce higher states of trance. And further down the line, why not enlightenment itself? As regards hacking the brain, you may have heard about the announcement by Elon Musk of the new device called N1 from his Neuralink company. This was in the news a few weeks ago. This device uses a small chip to read the brain with minuscule probes that are woven into the brain tissue. Neuralink places four of these N1 chips in a patient, three in a motor area and one by the somatic sensory cortex. They're then wired to an inductive coil near the ear that connects to a link that sits on the outside of the skin. The initial focus will be on helping patients with quadriplegia due to spinal cord injury and then conditions like Alzheimer's. But Musk also said, quote, this is going to sound pretty weird, but we want to achieve a symbiosis with artificial intelligence. This is not a mandatory thing. This is a thing <clears throat> that you can choose to have if you want. <clears throat> I think, he says, this is going to be something really important at a civilization scale level. Buddhists trans, or Buddhist transhumanists <clears throat> like James Hughes and Michael Latora, this is James Hughes on the right, and Michael Latour in the middle, <clears throat> both American uh, Buddhists. Uh, Hughes, for a while, was a Theravada monk, and Latour, I think, is a Zen priest. People um, like them welcome such developments and believe that emerging technologies can help build an environment that maximizes capacity for spiritual growth. Hughes is co-founder of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies and a participant in the Institute's Cyborg Buddha project. He believes spiritual growth can be enhanced through neurotechnology, the use of stimulants, design of smart drugs, 
and other psychoactive substances that enhance intelligence. Just as psychiatric medications can help people with depression lead a normal life, so tweaking brain chemistry, it is suggested, could heighten the perception of ordinary people, providing a techno boost that allowed them to see the world in a more enlightened way. While the effect of such enhancement may not be permanent, it could be potentially life-changing. Hughes believes that moral enhancement <clears throat> or virtue engineering may also be possible through technological means. If compassion is influenced by inherited genetic disposition and activated through neurochemistry, it might be possible through a combination of genetic engineering and neurotechnology to strengthen the tendency to experience and, and exhibit compassion consistently. While most of this, the discussion around moral enhancement has focused so far on boosting empathy, Hughes argues, not unreasonably, that a mature moral character requires the combining of multiple virtues, such as self-control, compassion, and wisdom. These are key building blocks of the spiritual happiness I discussed in the second lecture. Hughes believes certain of these virtues can be enhanced with electronic, pharmaceutical, and genetic technologies. <clears throat> Conscientiousness and self-discipline, for example, seem to be linked to the dopamine receptor. The hormone oxytocin induces feelings of trust and bonding. And anger and aggression also appear to be affected by particular genes. Here's a statement. Oh, sorry, jumped ahead there. Here's a statement by <clears throat> James Hughes. A kind of mission statement, if you like, for what we might call neurodharma. Future technologies will include drugs, implanted devices, and gene therapies that target specific moods, cognitions, impulses, and behaviors. From a Buddhist perspective, the growing ability to control our behavior will be an opportunity to suppress unskillful impulses and behaviors and enhance our practice of the virtues. Neurotechnologies will at first be relied on as temporary spiritual training wheels, helping to create a solid foundation of moral behavior, concentration, and mental clarity as part of the practice of self-reflection and meditation. <coughs> All this is pretty complicated, isn't it? It's a bit difficult to get your head around. Where is it all going? What does it all mean? Well, um, <clears throat> perhaps we can find the answer in Hollywood. <laughs> um, this is how I visualize this uh, trend or this pattern of development. <clears throat> uh, so on the left, you all recognize these characters, I take it. If not, you must get out more. <laughs> You've been too long in the library. On the left, who have we got? Robocop. Robocop, right. Now, Robocop was a policeman. I think his name was Alex Murphy in the film. And he had, uh, well, he was attacked by some criminals and uh, very badly um, <clears throat> damaged. And... Um, some large corporation then developed a way of bringing him back to life and giving him all these bionic uh, arms and legs and so, so forth. So they enhanced him and turned him into a kind of robot. But he was still a person. He was still inside Alex Murphy and an individual. Yeah. This, in a way, was a kind of development on an earlier TV series. I don't know if anybody, depends how old you are, but... Back in the mid-70s, there was a show called Six Million Dollar Man. Yeah? I think only the old, oldest of us will, will go back that far. Um, that was with Lee Majors, the actor who played that part. <clears throat> and he was, he was much less uh, enhanced than, this, than Robocop. I think. 
think Lee Mage has just had like a bionic eye and a bionic arm or something like that. He was just kind of a long way behind. <clears throat> but that's that trend. And this is a fairly understandable way for things to go. Bit by bit, we get more and more bionic things installed into us. Uh, so I don't think there's any conceptual problem with understanding this form of enhancement. Then we move to the next one. You recognize who that is. Come on, you Star Trek fans, you must. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Indeed it is, sir. You are quite correct. <laughs> That's exactly who it is. Uh, this is from um, Star Trek The Next Generation. And um, this is Captain Jean-Luc Picard, who in one episode is captured by this alien race called the Borg. They fly around space in a big cube, uh, doing evil things to everybody. And they captured him, <clears throat> and they implanted these kind of cybernetic implants into him in an attempt to turn him into a member of their species. These are cybernetic organisms connected together in a kind of hive mind. So they're a bit like a, a colony of ants um, or bees, something like that, <clears throat> all connected. And um, by various surgical techniques and injecting nanobots and one thing and another, they connected him up to this central intelligence. So this seems to be the next phase of where enhancement could go. So the first one, like Robocop, you're still an individual. But in the next phase, you're being assimilated into a larger kind of network. And your, your individuality is less important. You're sort of just part of this big colony. Then the third one. The Matrix. Keanu Reeves. I think there's been a few of these, haven't there now? Um, so what we've got here is another sort of leap forward uh, to a point where this person uh, in the matrix lives entirely in a virtual world, in a virtual reality. So the physical world we, we know, we see around us, has now disappeared altogether. He lives inside this c computer essentially, in a virtual reality. So this is another kind of leap forward, even beyond the networking one, <clears throat> where we're still sort of physically separate, but mentally connected here. We're totally inside the, um, the, uh, the computer. Yeah? Reality doesn't exist outside of that world. So that's just, just a way of thinking about how these things can go. Whether they will or not, who knows, but this is <clears throat> one way of looking at it. Okay, so <clears throat> how does all that sound? Does that sound like an appealing future for you? Yes? See some heads nodding there? Eager to be assimilated by the Borg? <laughs> um, other people not so sure? Um, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to imagine. It needs a leap of imagination to see how all this could happen and, and what it would be like to be enhanced in these various ways. <clears throat> so, um, problems from a Buddhist perspective. Some Buddhists, as we've seen, are quite enthusiastic about all of this. Uh, transhumanism. Others are not so sure. Some Buddhists point out that the Buddhist precepts seem to argue against this kind of development. The fifth precept prohibits the use of intoxicants and stimulants. So that's a possible objection. Um, on the other hand, Buddhism doesn't prohibit the use of medicine. 
And the fifth precept seems to present no obstacle to the use of non-addictive substances that enhance self-awareness. So the fifth precept uh, exists in order to prevent uh, mental confusion, let's say, through taking alcohol or drugs or whatever. Now, if you had something that actually made you more awake, more alert, sharper, that would seem to be in line with the precept, or certainly not um, in opposition to it. So anything that increases mindfulness, let's say, would seem to be a good thing. At the same time, we can make a distinction between treatment and enhancement. And the task of medicine, <clears throat> which Buddhism, of course, supports, is normally thought of as curing defects rather than making improvements. The line between the two, however, is blurred. And various uh, orthopedic implants in use today, for example, seem to be both a treatment and an enhancement, insofar as being made of material like titanium. They are more durable than the joints that nature provided us with. So if you have a hip implant, is that a treatment or an enhancement? Probably both, really. Ray Kurzweil says, we have devices to replace our hips, knees, shoulders, elbows, wrists, jaws, teeth, skin, arteries, veins, heart valves, arms, legs, feet, fingers and toes, and systems to replace more complex organs, for example, our hearts, are beginning to be introduced. As technology advances, what today is enhancement will probably be seen as routine treatment. Apart from moral improvement, a central transhumanist aim is the extension of lifespan. There seems no fundamental Buddhist objection to living longer. And the prolongation of life is a basic aim of Buddhist medicine. One obvious benefit of a longer life is that those committed to following the Bodhisattva path can do more good than if their lives were cut short earlier. So what about uh, the second point there? Apathy. Some people see a danger in extending our life so long that it loses its meaning or it loses its purpose. The lifespan of the gods, the Buddhist gods, is many times greater than that of human beings. But a vastly extended lifespan is not necessarily a greater good from a soteriological perspective. This is because life as a human being provides a reality check in bringing one face to face with the painful realities of birth, old age, sickness and death. James Hughes has written, I want to live until I'm so enlightened, I don't really care about continuing my life. But it may be that paradoxically, it's the very experience of impermanence and death that makes enlightenment possible. Death, perhaps, is the grit in the oyster that produces the pearl of wisdom. And it may be death that gives life its meaning. As the philosopher Bertrand Russell expressed it, if I live forever, the joys of life would inevitably in the end lose their savour. As it is, they remain perennially fresh. We should remember, it was only after the Buddha saw the four sights that he embarked on his religious career. It was the sight of old age, sickness and death that provoked an existential crisis in him, that set him on the path to awakening. If old age, sickness and death are eliminated by technology, there may be little motivation to search for a higher purpose to one's existence. 
Another common objection <clears throat> to transhumanist immortality is that the desire to live forever is misguided because it assumes the existence of a self, which Buddhism denies. Transhumanist views of the self, however, sometimes sound quite Buddhist. To quote Ray Kurzweil again, my body is temporary. Its particles turn over almost completely every month. Only our pattern of matter and energy persists. And even that gradually changes. Transhumanists also claim that rather than seeking to preserve an unchanging self, what extending one's lifetime can do, especially if this involves uploading one's personality and memory to a cyber host, or merging with a higher intelligence, is to enable a greater connection with others. By becoming a totally digital person and part of a vast network, the sense of self would be diminished. Indeed, it may be that physical embodiment is an obstacle or a handicap to perceiving the truth of no self. In other words, because we exist physically separately, that reinforces the idea we are independent selves. Furthermore, if awakened beings also form part of the same network, the prospects for achieving enlightenment may be greatly enhanced. What could be more helpful than a 24-7 connection to the mind of an enlightened teacher? The transhumanist message is certainly seductive. Who would not want to live in a world without death or suffering? <coughs> However, some see a tension in the transhumanist declaration between the imperative to seek the well-being of all sentience, while at the same time respecting autonomy and individual rights. Critics allege that individual rights and freedoms will inevitably be sidelined in the dash by large corporations. Here we think Google, Apple, Facebook, who, led by visionary entrepreneurs, seek to implement new technologies that will be limited to those who can pay for them. Others see in the transhumanist declaration an ideology that makes scientific reasoning the ultimate authority and denigrates belief systems based on religious or spiritual truth. These skeptics reject the transhumanist claim that the best way to fix human problems is through science and technology. They point out that there have been many technological developments since the Buddha's time, yet none has overcome the problem of human suffering. Many, in fact, have been a double-edged sword. Splitting the atom produced both nuclear energy and the atomic bomb. And the internet has enhanced communication, but given a global platform to pornographers and terrorists. Many young people suffer from psychological problems as a result of overexposure to the internet. In the same way, disembodied minds may simply develop new forms of neurosis. And a network of discrete minds in cyberspace may turn out to resemble the multiple personalities of a schizophrenic. In some, suffering may be endemic in a way that defies technological solutions. While Buddhism may be sympathetic to the aims of transhumanism in reducing suffering, it is unlikely to see the singularity as an alternative to nirvana. So, in conclusion, what I've discussed in these three lectures, of which you've only heard one, of course, but you will be able to see the others and you will be able to uh, 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 hear what I say there. I've discussed three forms of happiness. Worldly happiness, 
spiritual happiness and transhuman happiness. I suggested in the first we should not underestimate the importance of worldly happiness to our well-being overall. Spiritual happiness is undoubtedly more important than worldly happiness because worldly happiness is unstable and vulnerable to change. What I have called transhuman happiness is so far, at least, not really a new form of happiness so much as a program for the enhancement of the other two forms of happiness by technological means. What transhumanist technologies offer essentially is the extension of lifespan and the enhancement of our cognitive faculties. In effect, transhumanism offers a life similar to that enjoyed by the Buddhist gods, with all its advantages and disadvantages. Whether this transhumanist utopia will ever come about is a question to which only time will provide an answer. And I will stop at that point and say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kong, for the very inspiring lecture. Uh, I think we still have like about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so uh, the session is now open to the floor. If you have any question, please uh, raise your hand, we'll pass you the mic. Thanks, Professor, for very, very um, important presentations. I, I, we hope actually if you could also give us an extended version on your video recording for the third one as well. Uh, I think my, my question is usually from kind of an academic standpoint is trying to actually learn more about the landscape. Uh, you talk about James Huey and of course you have done very important work in, in this subject. What are the kind of important scholars or kind of a frontier of research people have been doing in this particular area in terms of transhuman uh, uh, transhuman happiness uh, and of course there are also a lot of discussions about AI as well uh, <clears throat> yes thanks for your question um, perhaps surprisingly there's not that much um, being done in this area from a Buddhist perspective I think you had Professor Lancaster here not long ago in this series and I think he talked about some of these uh, ideas and problems more, more of the problems, I think, uh, that arise from them. But this is not a mainstream topic in Buddhist studies by any means. And um, quite often, I feel quite isolated in, uh, <laughs> in talking about them because there's no background. People don't have a sort of, you know, interest or background or haven't thought of how to apply Buddhism to these problems so far. So there's not a vast amount of literature. Um, on, uh, I think the main area is in this neurotechnology where people are looking into meditation and studying the effects of meditation through scientific methods using brain scans and so forth. That is quite developed. Um, <clears throat> but on the, um, on the other aspects, there isn't a great amount you can look at. There is quite a lot on the internet by James Hughes who I mentioned there, and he's written a lot, and a lot of it's quite interesting. Uh, and that's easily available. You can find pages and pages and articles by him quite easily. So I would say he's probably the best place to start with. Um, but overall, not, not a lot really to get your teeth into. You know, we need to have more people uh, pursuing these questions. Um, it's not an orthodox sort of topic in the, in the curriculum. Perhaps you can introduce something here at HKU. <laughs> Hi, yes, uh, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify just what you mean by transhumanist happiness. Uh, I understand that there are certain transhumanist technologies which are conducive to happiness, uh, like life extension and so on but uh, a genuinely transhumanist existence or like di fully digital existence. I was wondering to what extent um, the notion of happiness even makes sense in a totally disembodied um, 
non-biological mm. um, existence or consciousness. I'm not sure if it can be called consciousness. Uh, you know, with Buddhist psychology being so um, uh, central to the uh, analysis of the human condition, um, does that psychology, does the, you know, this human psychology of, uh, you know, four types of mental skandhas and so on and how that interacts to create suffering in, in embodied existence, um, is that sort of necessary, the, that kind of psychology, psychological framework, is that necessary for the, um, for there to be suffering such that it should be alleviated um, and without that kind of uh, human biological psychology, the idea of uh, the alleviation of suffering just wouldn't uh, really apply in a mm. digital context. Well, that's, that's a $64,000 question. Um, <clears throat> and I, I didn't go into that very much because it's very hard to imagine what it would be like. Um, what's it like to live in the matrix? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think anybody knows, basically, whether it's even possible to be connected to a computer in that sort of way. Um, so we can only speculate, but what we can say is, of course, that the, what we call worldly happiness, as we know it now, which is happiness in which we depend upon sort of other people, uh, we depend upon things like economic security, friendship, um, status, social status, uh, pleasure, um, things of that kind that we take for granted that everybody would, wishes they had more of, that will drop out of the picture, I imagine, to a large extent. Certainly material things won't be of much value. You know, how much money you've got in the bank uh, won't count, uh, won't buy you anything, won't buy you any happiness, certainly. So um, I think, first of all, we need to try and think what it, to imagine what it would be like to be in that kind of a situation, to exist in that way as a disembodied entity. And... All we can do is let our imagination run wild and see where we come to. I find it very hard to imagine personally what it would be like for me to be in that state. Um, so maybe other people have got their own sort of vision of how that would be. Um, but presumably it would be a purely mental form of happiness, like one of the highest states of trance, one of the higher jhanas, um, but whether that would automatically happen just because you had no body, I, I don't think that that would be the case. You know, that's something you need to train yourself to achieve. Whether you're embodied or disembodied, your mind will probably be floating all over the place just like it is normally. So um, perhaps you could say you put Buddhist teachings into practice in a disembodied kind of state. Uh, you practice concentration meditation, and you cultivate purely mental qualities of that kind. But really, it's all, it's all speculation. So, any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm relatively new to Buddhism, I, I don't know much about it, but it seems to me that um, I was interested in that idea of cryonics, and it seems to this layman that this is the height of arrogance, hubris, selfishness. Isn't it part of who or what we are that we all clear off after two or three generations and give those generations as yet unborn a chance to live rather than prolong our own? Well, up to now, that's always been the way, um, because we didn't have any choice, I suppose. There was no option to live any longer than your three score and ten years. Um, now, for the first time, there are possibilities, and whether it's good or bad is, is the question we're, we're faced with. A lot of people think it's good, obviously. They've signed up to it. They've, they've got into the tank with their heads frozen or their brains frozen in a tank, what kind of existence that is, I don't know, but it's a search for immortality. It's what people have always longed for and yearned for. Even Buddhists want to be reborn as gods. Why? Because you live for a long time. You live for thousands of years instead of 
having a short human lifespan. So people seem to want that. Whether they should want that, I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, that's one point of view. But who would not want to live longer if you had the chance? Do you think, up. Do, oh, sorry. <laughs> do you think there's a chance that, that science will eventually find out how karma works, how, how the, uh, the supposedly we actually go to a new, a new life, how, how the information we have in our brain is passed on to some new body? Gosh, that's a difficult one. Um, <clears throat> where the science will find out. Uh, it's conceivable. I mean, if, it's, um, if, it's, if it happens in the way Buddhism says it happens, then presumably there's some mechanism um, by which it works. And if there's a mechanism, then there's an explanation for it. So it's not inconceivable. Um, how they would do it technologically, I mean, I Will there be an app for it then? <laughs> <laughs> um, an app to choose your next rebirth or something like that. That would be quite handy. But um, who knows? You know. Uh, I know that you may have more questions, but uh, in the interest of time, maybe need, we need to end here. So, um, could we put our hands together again to <laughs> Professor Ko? for his wonderful lecture. <laughs> we very much hope to have chance to learn from his wisdom again very soon. And uh, for the video makeup arrangement of the first two lectures, we will make announcement very soon. So thank you once again for your participa participation and support to the event tonight. And we hope to see you all again in our future events. Thank you and have a nice evening.